Great. Um, so thank you so much to everyone for joining. We're actually going to start with um, some words of welcome for Professor, Professor Kobo. Um, if you want to come up straight away, that would be... This uh, discussion, uh, which the VET School of Governance is hosting with, with ODI uh, on the theme, Do Ministers uh, Matter for Audit uh, Performance? As Africa's leading school of governance, the VET School of Governance is delighted to be a part of this collaboration. Our mission as a school is to advance inclusive, transformative, and ethical governance on the African continent and undertaking rigorous research and convening policy dialogues are some of the aspects of, of that mission. Uh, today's theme is on leadership and public finance management. Sorry, public finance management, yes. And uh, this theme is especially important for South Africa today as it grapples with the after effects of a state capture. Some would say state capture part one. This work broadens our understanding of the relationship between those that are in leadership, especially uh, those that are occupying a role as executive authorities and, and, um, and, and audit, audit performance. Much of the focus in the past uh, has been on, um, on municipal finances, especially uh, you know, the, the, the reports of the Auditor General uh, on municipalities and we sometimes uh, tend to lose the focus on uh, the critical layer, which is the national departments, and in particular, uh, the ministers uh, within uh, this, these departments. The research undertaken by ODI, uh, and I've, I've gone through it, uh, is in depth and looks at a particular period in South Africa, the state capture era. It is, of course, as I uh, signaled earlier, a matter of contention uh, whether state capture ended with a political with a political demise of President Jacob Zuma, or it is continuing under multiple uh, guises. The core message of the ODI uh, research report is that there is a clear relationship between uh, leadership on the one hand and ethical and developmental outcomes on the other. As I indicated, uh, this is a timely research that offers insights on how we should think about the executive layer of government, uh, the robustness of the constraints or counterweight of the accounting officers, uh, and here I'm referring to the directors general, um, and the linkage between audit performance and delivery of critical public services, especially uh, in sectors such as education and health. For the VET School of Governance, uh, this research offers a useful research, um, a useful resource for our uh, program on public finance management, and we run uh, several programs uh, on different platforms online and, and on site. Um, across uh, the postgrad diploma um, uh, in management program to the masters uh, in, of management in the field of governance. It will also help us to enrich the insights of the research program that we've recently launched uh, under the leadership of Professor Temba Maseko on state capture and building state capacities. So we really, really are looking forward to the outcomes of today's discussion. And I hope that this could be the beginning of uh, a long-term collaboration between uh, the VET School of Governance and ODI on themes where we have shared interests, especially on public finance management. With those words, I would like to, to welcome you and uh, to wish you uh, the best um, in your deliberations uh, today. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Professor Kobo, and thank you very much to the Witt School of Governance, um, particularly Rukhoto Fetze Chikane and Mani Bianca for um, helping us get this on the ground and hosting us and also putting together such a great panel who will join me shortly. Are you welcome to come up now if you want? Um, so we too hope that this will be the start of a collaboration that lasts very long between ODI and WSG. And thank you very much to everyone who's taken time out of their Friday afternoon to join us and to everyone who's online. So um, for those who are online, there is a chat function and a Q&A. Please keep posting there and we'll get to that towards the end. Um, my colleague Rukhoto Fetze will um, monitor that for us. Um, so, and if the um, power switches off um, during the presentations, it will come back on um, shortly, so just hang on and stay online, please. Um, so, my name is Danielle Cerebro. I, my background is in public financial management at an organization called the Collaborative Africa Budget Reform Initiative, and I'm also a research associate at ODI. And for those who don't know, um, ODI is an independent global think tank producing um, internationally recognized research on key global problems, convening leaders around this, and influencing policymaking. Um, so today's event builds on a paper by Joachim Weiner and his colleagues at LSE Martin House and Daniel Berliner on Do Ministers Matter for Audit Performance? And this research forms part of ODI's um, Public Finance and Service Delivery Working Paper Series. And with this working paper series, we try to investigate what helps and hinders the provision of services from a public financial management perspective. Um, so I think the paper really reiterates that South Africa is something of a paradox. We have some of the world's strongest institutions from a public financial management perspective, and yet we, have, we are plagued by corruption and poor service delivery. And I think our very esteemed panel will help us uncover some of the reasons behind that and some of the things that we can do or can't do including whether individuals can actually make a difference or we really need significant systemic changes in this country. Um, so first up on the right, we have Joachim Weiner, who's Associate Professor in Public Policy at the Department of Government at the London School of Economics. Um, Joachim previously lived in South Africa and knows the context extremely well. Um, he worked at the Institute for Democracy in South Africa um, and holds a PhD from LSE where he currently teaches a course on public financial management. Um, Joachim also was the founding director of the Executive Masters in Public Administration and Masters in Public Policy program um, in the School of Policy at LSE. Um, and thank you, Joachim, for coming all the way from the UK for this. We very much appreciate it. So then we have uh, Tamsang Kwezakode, who is the head of portfolio in the Office of the Auditor General. Um, he's responsible for major state-owned enterprises, and parastatals, that includes Danel, ESCOM, and many others. Um, he also leads the specialized audit services, and that includes performance audit, amongst others. Uh, Tommy was previously chief audit executive at the South African Broadcasting Commission, or SABC, and he's a qualified chartered accountant and holds an MBA from the University of Stellenbosch and an MPhil management from the University of UCAM in Spain. And then finally, we have um, Professor Pandi Pule, who until a couple of months ago when he retired was a professor here um, of economics and public finance. And before entering academia, where he was for a very long time at different organizations, um, he was head of the policy unit at the office of the president and was also executive director um, of the Fiscal and Financial Commission. And he has a PhD in economics and an MA in economics from the University of Cape Town. So clearly a very esteemed panel. Um, so we'll begin the discussion now with a presentation by Joachim on the paper's key findings, and that will be followed by some reflections from Pandi and Tummy. Uh, we'll then have around, I hope, 30 minutes from inputs for inputs from the audience and from online, so comments and questions to the panel. And um, for the online audience, as I said, please do post um, questions, comments in the chat, um, and also use the Q&A function. So over to you, Joachim. Thanks. Thank you very much for having me here and hosting this fantastic event. I really do appreciate the opportunity. So as Danielle said, this is a work done jointly with two of my colleagues at the London School of Economics. And we asked the question, do ministers matter for audit performance? And we cover this period, as you pointed out uh, in, in, the, in your very kind introduction of this recent period where there was a lot of concern about ministerial 
appointments in South Africa. And here's just a little bit of, I, I'm not sure many of you need uh, motivation for why we're thinking about ministerial appointments. You know, here's some of, uh, here are some examples illustrating how much debate and public concern some, some of the recent uh, cabinet appointments over the past decades generated, for example, in areas related to mining and, of course, in, in the Treasury. But let me just uh, start very quickly with some background and, and motivation. So cabinet appointments have been in the spotlight in South Africa, but not only in South Africa. They're often in the spotlight in, in many countries. So it's, it's a good question to ask, why should we care? Do they matter? And to what extent? And that is essentially what we are trying to do in this paper. And we study this question. Sorry. Like this? A bit closer? Yeah? Sorry. Apologies. So we study this uh, looking at audit performance in various areas, including sports teams, you know, businesses, uh, and, and government as well. We have this focus for at least two reasons. One is that we care about audits. So we think that an audit outcome, having reliable public financial information, uh, is at least a necessary condition for effective service del delivery. It is not it is not a sufficient one, it doesn't guarantee effective service delivery, but if you can't document how you spend your money, it's very uncertain that you could deliver. And second, citizens also have a right to know where their money goes. So having good quality information on how public money is spent is simply a right that all of us have. Here's how we did it. Essentially, we took a lot of time assembling data from the Auditor General for 15 financial years, uh, we matched this to national government departments using the estimates of national expenditure, and then we spent a lot of time researching who were the ministers in charge of each department in our data set, and also who was the DG in, in charge uh, for, for every month of the period that, that we cover. And then what we do in our statistical work, and I'm going to sort of uh, not present the full details of this, but I'm going to summarize it. We essentially test whether ministers matter, even when we account for the portfolios which they ran, some of which are easier to run than others, and when they were in office, because uh, certain things, certain years also make a more difficult context, for example, for running a ministry. Think about pandemics, for example, or election years. And then we use this approach that I hinted at earlier uh, to, to study what happens when you move ministers across different portfolios and we adopt a sort of approach that has been used in the, in the literature on the, on the performance of, of uh, big US corporations when CEOs get moved uh, across different firms. And when we uh, code our data, essentially we're interested in particular in ministers that move across departments and over this period, there are 28 out of 95 cabinet ministers that we can see in more, more than one department. And that's essentially what, what is giving us the statistical information that, that we are exploiting. Let me just show you some of the data. Um, we have a colleague here from the Auditor General who's much better qualified than me to talk about audit outcomes. But essentially, we, have, we take the audit outcomes uh, for all national departments, and we give them a number. Uh, if, if the number is high, it means you had a very good audit outcome. You had a clean audit. Everything was in audit with your financial statements and with the information on predetermined objectives, as well as compliance with key legislation. If you have a very low number, then, you, then it's very troubling, and essentially your, your um, audits, uh, your financial statements are not trustworthy. They cannot be relied on. And when you look across national government departments over the past 15 years, you see uh, a, an improvement on average, so pooling all of the data on the left, but then also quite a bit of movement up and down. And in the second graph here, we've sort of broken national government departments into two groups. One is uh, departments that relate to social service 
uh, social services or basic services, for example, health, education, water, uh, and housing versus others. Um, and it's in particular the first group where we're looking at uh, uh, portfolios that potentially have a big influence on, on development outcomes in, in South Africa that we see quite pronounced volatility in audit performance, in particular here in the second uh, period of President Zuma's term, there was a notable sort of deterioration in audit outcomes. And just to give you an illustration of how we put this together in our data set, um, we essentially have uh, the audit result for every year, uh, and we have the minister in charge for the majority of that year, and we have the audit audit results. So this is a table for the uh, Department of Cooperative Governance as an illustration. For the 15 years in our data, stat, data set, we have the audit, the audit outcome, we have the minister in charge, and that allows us to, to sort of link, try to link the two. What is the connection between who's in charge and the audit outcome? And we did that for every single government department and also accounting for splits in government departments and subsequent remergers of them. So if you just look uh, at, at some of the variation across the key variables that, that we examine, if you look here on the left, if you look at the average audit outcomes uh, over time, our year-specific spe year averages actually, they cluster very narrowly uh, um, along or around a mean of an of a, um, unqualified with findings uh, audit outcome, but there's a little bit of variation across the years. Where you see a lot more variation in averages is when you average by department, which is the middle graph, or when you average audit outcomes over this period by minister, which is the last graph. So we have a lot of variation associated with uh, different departments, some on average do a lot better than others, and with ministers, which is the second graph. And this is our key variable of interest in, in the paper. I'm going to summarize my, re, my results in words rather than show you statistical tables, although I'm very happy to pull those up as well later if people would like to. So we do two main tests. They're not terribly uh, sophisticated tests, but very sort of bread and butter and very um, uh, well-established ones. So the first is that we test whether Minister fixed effects, so these effects for the individual ministers that we have are jointly significant, which is the case in all models that we run and all robustness checks. In the sec second analysis that we do, we also decompose the variance that we observe in audit outcomes and relate that to the three explanatory variables that I just showed you, and that reveals that roughly around 30% of the variation in audit outcomes is associated with variation in departments. So which department is it all about? About 30% is associated with the ministers and very little is associated with uh, the year in which the audit outcome was obtained. Um, essentially, uh, we do it like, a, let me just mention that we do a third sort of test to, to try to understand whether ministers maybe get moved around depending on their audit performance and we actually find relatively little evidence of that, which would be a, a more worrying thing if, if we did find that. But the big conclusion of the first two tests that we do is A, in statistical terms, ministers matter, and B, the variation in audit performance that they are associated with is quite substantial. 30% uh, of, of um, the variation in audit performance is associated with who's the minister. And that is quite, quite a significant uh, uh, amount. So let me just show you some of the value of putting these factors together in a statistical model is essentially that it allows you when thinking about what is the performance of ministers it allows you to account for two things in particular. Some portfolios are harder to run than others, and some years might be easier or harder uh, you know, for running a department. Pandemics, for example, election years, as I said before. 
And that results, if you adjust ministerial averages for the portfolios and for the years in which ministers were in charge, this also leads to a slightly different score than just averaging across ministers. And a nice example here is Minister Mozzoledi, who ran uh, the health department for quite a long time. Um, you know, his, his average audit outcome was uh, not as good as the adjusted audit outcome because he, he ran a de department that in, at other times performed uh, worse in terms of audits. Um, and sort of adjusting for that lifts up uh, the, the score that we calculate for him. So taking account of the difficulty, the inherent difficulty of running different portfolios, and when you are in charge, helps us to evaluate the performance of different individuals in the cabinet um, uh, differently, at least. So this is an illustration of that. I should say here that if there was no difference between what we were doing and uh, just taking the average for a minister, so just t calculating an average audit score, or, you know, they, all the dots would be on this line here because the graph plots the average for each minister on the x-axis against the adjusted score that is a result of our statistical work in the paper. But we do find quite a bit of dispersion around this, uh, this dotted line, which tells us that some ministers are evaluated as having performed better and some uh, as worse given the adjustments that we incorporate. So let me finish here. This is my last slide um, to and reflect on some, some of the implications. So I think at a very important level, um, and, but more abstractly perhaps, despite many limitations of what we're doing in this paper, I think we do some things really well and it is a starting point. But there are limitations. Our analysis highlights the importance of thinking beyond uniform systems, structures, and procedures in analyzing public financial management and organizational performance more broadly. South Africa is a world leader in terms of the systems and the, um, the broad structures and the legal framework for public financial management. Um, but what we find here is that within this uniform set of system uh, structures and procedures, we get a lot of variation that can be attributed to individuals. And that tells us essentially that good governance depends not only on getting the framework right, the institutions, the procedures, but also having the right people in charge. Getting the right people to run these institutions is very important. And I want to highlight sort of two things. One, one of the things that we are busy with now and taking this work f uh, further is to incorporate the provincial level. So <laughs> It was quite challenging to do this at the national government level, but we're doing a lot of hard work trying to collect the same data for all the provinces, all the provincial departments, and also the PFMA Schedule II uh, public entities, state-owned uh, 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 enterprises in, in particular. And that gets us a, a bit closer to where the actual service delivery is happening. So that's a quite important element. So that's one direction of, of travel. I want to highlight two policy implications, and we have um, uh, the debate afterwards to also reflect on that, um, but here too. I think one uh, practical policy implication might be, might be that we uh, might think about targeting audit activity also based on political risk. So when there is a turnover in the political head of a department, maybe that's a moment where it pays to pay close attention to who is this person, and in particular, what is the audit track record of that person? And that might give us a sort of mechanism to help target audit resources at particular entities. That might be one conclusion we could uh, raise here. The second one is, if individuals matter, um, I think one type of audit that would help to foster more accountability for delivery are performance audits. So what I was talking about here, uh, audits of the financial statements and of compliance and of the performance information, but not of the actual delivery, of the uh, asking whether uh, actual delivery was as, as intended and whether it's good enough, essentially. What is the efficiency, effectiveness of delivery? And I think that would give rise to a, a, a 
conversation that is more targeted to individual accountability. Let me stop here, and I'm, I very much look forward to uh, discussing this with you further. Thank you. Thanks so much, Joachim. Um, so we're just going to have initial reflections from Pandi and Tami. So, um, Pandi, maybe we can start with you in terms of just thinking through how this research matters for governance and service delivery in South Africa. And then, um, Tami, maybe you can come in in terms of um, how the audit process actually engages with questions of financial governance and service delivery performance. And at the same time, maybe touching on why is leadership important for financial governance and how the AG actually evaluates and encourages effective leadership. Thanks. So, Pandi, over to you. So the point I'm making here is that not all national departments are responsible for service delivery. So there's a certain, there's a degree of limitation to, your, to, the, to the findings uh, that you make. And even where they are delivering services at the national level, how do you actually measure the performance of departments like foreign affairs, uh, defense, uh, you know, unless we go to war or something? You know, how, do you, how do you measure uh, performance and, and accountability? Uh, so I think that the, the overall point one wants to make, and I know that I've only been given five minutes this, this round, is that I think this is a great beginning. Uh, but I think that, and I'm sure that you are planning to delve more deeply into these issues. Uh, but I think there's some serious question marks. If you, if you take the example of Motswaledi, for example, uh, you know, he was Minister of Health for a long time, and then he became Minister of Home Affairs. Neither of those two departments can by any stretch of the imagination be defined as effective and, and efficient. So although the, your, your equations may show that there is some degree of accountability here, uh, it leaves some questions unanswered about whether there, there's, a, there's, a dig, there's a link between uh, audits and actual performance of, of ministers. And then I, you know, the last point I want to make is which I made also, and that is the question of uh, the political system that we have, uh, which is of course a very decentralized system, uh, tells us nothing about, and, and this is not an area that you've explored, but I'm trying to kind of twist your arm to uh, do this in the future. Uh, and I think it's a much more interesting study, both in terms of linking uh, audits and performance, would be from a study of provincial government and municipalities. So let me leave it there uh, for now. Thanks, and uh, afternoon. Um, I think the, the question of how does the audit process engage with the question of financial governance and service delivery uh, performance is it's actually a, a crucial question, especially looking at the role of the executive authority or the ministers, and that's how they are defined in the PFMA. The ministers are defined as the executive authorities. What we have done over the past as the Office of the Auditor General, we actually strived to look at how the minister engage the auditors when we were sort of having a brief discussion on the audit outcomes of the respective entities. And what we've observed and what has been our experience was that the ministers that were actually leading by example and setting the right tone, despite not being accountable directly for the audit outcomes, but they did engage with the uh, uh, direct subordinate, which in this case are the DGs, their chief directors and the directors to say, as this minister, I would really want to see an improvement in terms of the audit outcomes. And that for us was a good starting point in terms of leading a way to good governance. And the crux of what we have been trying to solve is the issue around how do we then get to the point where when we then define the audit outcomes in the end, it translates directly to the issue of the service delivery. 
So there's a whole lot of elements that, uh, or variables that are taking place in that particular scenario. You will then have to look at the issue around where does uh, the service delivery normally occurs, and most of it, we all agree, is at local government sphere, most of it. So when we looked at how some of the predetermined objectives were set, we then tried by all means not to engage or dispute what the government was saying in terms of policy making. So we did not play a role in policy making. We just limited our engagements and our discussion in terms of what you saying you're going to be delivering for the year. And that's how we actually measured it. We just focused on the predetermined objectives on an annual basis for this year. Is it something that is reliable? Is it something that can be measured? Do you have evidence to support it? Do you have all of those nice things that will actually get you to where you want to go in terms of service delivery? But then the biggest problem is a lot of those issues that we'd find at right at the beginning in terms of the annual performance plan as well as the annual performance reports, most of them does not necessarily translate into service delivery. But service delivery is defined uh, differently by different kinds of people. So what we've then said is there is a big role that the HSA has to play in terms of trying to make sure that we influence the financial governance. And among the issues that we need to do is to actually influence the whole accountability ecosystem. And in influencing the whole accountability ecosystem, we then need to say, look, right before you get to the point where your strategic plans, your annual plans and everything else is approved, let's engage and see whether Based on your mandate, if your role is to provide water, if your role is to provide um, uh, security, or if your role is to provide electricity, for an example, if we look at your APP, your plans that you have, and this is what you want to put forward, will actually this assist you in achieving your mandate, yes or no? And if the answer is no, we then need to have an engagement where you go back and you try and streamline those. And even there, we're not going to be forcing it's an issue of saying, let's rather engage, because what we've actually seen is a situation where we issue audit reports, and in terms of the audit reports we issue, we have some clean audits, and then later on in the very same place where we've issued a clean report, two days later, we have a service delivery protest. That, that told us a story to say maybe there's something that we need to tweak so that we can talk to the issues. So overall, I want to support and i'm happy with the the paper that has been done and i think it's a, it's a good starting point just like any other form of research that gets done there's other areas that can be explored and for us yes there is a a, a particular role that the ministers could play in terms of um, driving the right behavior setting the right tone ensuring that the audit outcomes improved albeit the ministers not directly being accountable for those audit outcomes. And that has been some of the engagements we had. Uh, because when one looks at our general report right towards the end, this annex just, there's a space where we normally rated the, account, the, the accounting authority, which is the boards for state-owned entities, executive authorities, audit and risk committees, and everybody else. In that area, we rated the ministers. But that rating was actually a narrow rating in terms of what were the commitments you made to the AGSA in terms of you trying to drive clean administration and ensuring that you improve the audit outcomes? And since we've implemented that, we've seen a change in behavior where the ministers are active in terms of dealing with uh, the audit issues, engaging on audit issues, and making sure that they provide where required uh, the support to their teams. I will stop there for now. Thanks. So Thank you so much. These were great comments, and I'm, I'm happy to say that, at least with regard to some of them, we are thinking in these directions. So as I, as I said earlier, we are, we are working on extending the analysis to the provincial level. Municipalities would be extremely hard um, to, to also incorporate into this, but uh, we, we will look at that. Let me just talk to a few of the other points as well. So we also collected information on the directors general. We know uh, who was the individual uh, who had that role in every national department. There were a few months where we couldn't get the information because there is no centralized database on this. 
uh, for the 15 years that, that we cover, and we also know whether that was an acting appointment or a permanent one. And that could be also important in, in thinking about, for example, to what extent do DGs matter in this regard versus the political authority of the minister? Um, I, I would sort of um, make a few points uh, that speak to this question. Is it really about the minister or should we be looking at the DG? So first of all, all the results I talked about go through when we account for the DGs in, in charge and whether they were in charge in an acting or permanent uh, capacity at the time. So this doesn't destroy what I talked about in terms of our statistical finding about ministers mat mattering. Second, um, we do a lot of other things uh, to sort of think about uh, attribution. And uh, so, for example, we might say maybe there's a minister in charge one year who then lays the foundation for success in the following year. So one of the things that we check uh, um, in the data is whether when we lag, when we essentially attribute audit outcomes to the minister in charge in the previous financial year, whether that relationship shows up and it still survives, for example. So there's a lot of like, careful thinking we've put into this that speaks to this question, to what extent is it really the minister or someone else? Is it the DG? I should add one last thing. When we sort of check whether ministers matter in future departments, we find no effect. That's important too, because it shouldn't matter. Yeah, if you haven't put the minister in there yet, you shouldn't statistically find something. And all of these checks that we do make us believe that there is something going on here that has to do with ministers. And I think the reason has a little bit to do with, um, you, you know, what, what we just uh, heard about, that essentially when you go to the minister, the minister may not be the person ultimately in charge, but I think what is really important is that person can set the tone at the top. And that can matter a huge amount, you know, what the attitude is of the minister, how, how much the minister cares about uh, what goes on in the depths of, of the department that can really set the tone for other officials in, in the department. So I just wanted to point some of that out. We worry about that. We worry about maybe over attributing any of this to ministers. And there's already quite a lot of stuff that we do in the paper to double check that that's not the case. And everything that we do with all the caveats, persuades us that our re results hold, that there is some role for ministers, even when you account for DGs and you sort of think about the relationship in, in more complicated ways. Just very, uh, very quickly about um, maybe one, one last point that I thought was especially important. I think we would be expecting too much of the Auditor General if we said, this is the Auditor General's problem to fix is not. And that was, I think, why talking about the accountability uh, ecosystem, the broader infrastructure that is important here, that was a really essential point, right? Auditors are experts and they are non-political, they're independent, and they, you're blessed in South Africa with one of the most highly regarded audit institutions in the world, if you look at international assessments. But the role of the AG in turning, or in improving governance uh, is, is a limited one. You know? So the Auditor General's report, findings have to go to the legislature, the national legislature, provincial legislatures, the municipal councils. What are they doing with it? And there is an important role here for public accounts committees and for portfolio committees in the national and provincial legislatures. Are they using this information? Are they doing enough? What are their incentives to do that? So there are other actors that also need to deliver, you know, and uh, including civil society and, and the media. So I would just say, you know, you, the Auditor General, let's push the Auditor General as far as possible in, in contributing towards this, but then let's not forget that the Auditor General needs allies and there are important other institutions that we need to think about in order to sort of bring that together in order to improve performance across government. Let me leave it there. Um, so I think, um, Pindi, maybe we can start with you in terms of um, what you think around what kind of leaders we need in our current context and 
how we actually go about developing such leaders. So it's a bit of a step away from this, but like, I guess the next implication. Um, and then, Tammy, maybe you can discuss how and what other departments and agencies can actually learn from the um, Auditor General's consistently high organizational performance. As Joachim mentioned, it's almost an island of excellence in this country and managing to maintain its independence throughout the Zuma years. Um, and then, Joachim, maybe in terms of lessons from other areas of governance about the role of leaders, um, so like looking at the difference between experts and professional politicians as ministers, I know that you have um, forthcoming, a forthcoming book on um, economists as policymakers, so maybe starting to think through that. Um, okay, I'm going to hand you the roving mic, hopefully that works. I think that the last point you make is that it, it may well be that we're putting too much on the Auditor General's office because they're not really responsible for service delivery questions. But they've taken it on in, in the absence of other public institutions not doing it effectively. But, I, and I don't know how much you know about this, but in our system, we have DPMEs all over the place, you know, departments of performance management and evaluation. And well, I sometimes ask myself, what are they actually doing? Uh, particularly in the provinces and, and municipalities in terms of monitoring this kind of activity. Uh, so, I mean, it's <laughs> the, what kind of leaders do we need? Uh, you know, that's a kind of open-ended question. We need uh, leaders who are innovative, uh, leaders who uh, deliver according to the mandate that they are given by the people. Uh, and so we're failing in all of this, uh, as we know. Uh, so, yeah, I think we need leaders who can show initiative in terms of uh, getting development going uh, because and this lack of development and lack of equitable development in particular is not something that just came about when Zuma uh, walked into the union buildings which is the kind of conventional wisdom. Uh, this uh, government has failed to deliver for a long time uh, on a, a range of, uh, of services which is inhibiting uh, the kinds of development uh, th that, that we need. Thanks, Kunti. I think on the question on um, what can other departments and agencies learn from the HSA, I think there's quite a few things which the office got right. I think the first big ticket item was the office was very lucky, I think, to have a good number of leaders that were there previously. I mean, I talk from the times of your Shoket Faiki, your Terrences, your Gimis of this world up until now with Zakani Maluleke. And when one looks at all those leaders, one thing's come to mind. The biggest issue which they normally speak about is the issue of integrity. And when you have a leader that speaks the issue of integrity, but also leave integrity on a day-to-day basis, day -day basis, you can witness what the leader do or does. It says a lot because all the employees do, they don't normally do what the leaders say. Employees normally do what the leaders does. And from that, we, we learn that for the organization, it was a big concept to deal with this issue of ethical leadership. You know, there were times where we had serious conflict it's either we issue this particular opinion as is and face all the political pressure we can face, or we bow down to pressure. And we opted to go to facing the pressure as big as the pressure was. And for us, it also helped that the whole environment in the organization was so professionalized such that Ethics, as well as the issue of professionalism. I think we've got uh, the big, uh, the, I would say a number of our staff members are actually CAs, which normally subscribe to high ethical standards. And once you have an environment that is driven by those people who want to be seen to be there to do the right thing at all times, you are bound then to fight even bigger battles and not bow down to pressure. Then the last issue that, we, that worked for us was to say, Let's be able to separate audit issues from political issues. We're auditing an environment which somebody might say is highly political, but by all means, 
we stayed away from political issues and focused on what are the financial state statements telling us, what are the compliance issues telling us, what is the service delivery issues telling us, except the issue that there might be political interference or political influence in the space. That has helped a great deal um, in terms of us maintaining the high ethical standards and as well as the high performance that we see in the environment. Thanks. So let, let me see if I can sum up in a couple of minutes what my answer would be to this very challenging question that you posed and also hoping to link a little bit to what you just said about integrity, for example. So um, we know that there's a big literature on sort of leadership and what are the, the traits of good leaders. Um, and uh, one finding, for example, for whatever that's worth, and there may be some academic bias in it, is that more educated leaders, for example... Sorry, I'm going to turn off your lapel mic. I'm sorry yep. to do it. So one finding that we know from the literature is that, uh, you know, if you look at, for example, the growth performance of governments, there's a literature that has made the point that more educated leaders tend to produce higher growth in, in countries. And some of that is fairly accepted by now. Um, but I think there's a you know, there's also a risk that uh, we turn our politicians into de degree collectors. So they sort of collect these badges in order to become politicians. So I also sometimes worry, worry about that, even though I'm an academic and I should, should actually say we should always study and, and get more, more degrees. I think the, the issue of integrity... You talk to, um, this is really a challenge for democratic accountability. Um, so this is about political selection. How do you reward good people when they do a good job? And how do you get rid of bad people when they do a bad job? That is the key challenge. And uh, there's one amazing paper from Brazil that colleagues uh, did a, a number of years ago that really speaks to this question. They, in Brazil, they sort of randomly selected municipalities for audits. and because they randomized that some municipalities got audited before an election and others after. And what the paper found that essentially if an audit detected corruption in, in a municipality, the re-election prospects of the mayor collapsed. What they, what they also found out if, was that if the audit detected no corruption, the re-election prospects of the mayor went up. So the, the re-election essentially um, was assured, almost assured, was very, very, very high. So it's these sorts of mechanisms that I think need to work. And I do think audits have a role to play in this, maybe not always like in this very specific way as here, but you know, how do we get people to use audit information in order to reward leaders that have integrity, that spend the money well, and that perform, that deliver services versus those who do not? Um, very, very briefly, and then I stop, you asked this question about technicians versus experts, and that is something I worry about a great deal at the moment. It's an empirical question. I think we need to evaluate, uh, you know, is it better to have a doctor who's, who's a health minister rather than, a, you know, someone who has no medical background? Uh, are economists as finance ministers better finance ministers than non-economists? I think my sense is that this may depend on the moment in time which we have. So if you have a crisis where you need the leader to have a really strong understanding of what's, what's going on in that particular area, you have a pandemic, for example, it could be quite valuable to have someone in charge who understands what's going on. In the UK, we had um, someone in, as health minister who apparently watched uh, a Hollywood blockbuster to figure out how to respond to the pandemic, a film called Contagion and he, who had no medical background. So I much rather would have had someone in charge who had, say, a, a, a background in epidemiology or, or some medical degree instead. Let me stop there. Um, I'll start with Tammy, I think, again. Um, in terms of how can audit and service delivery be more closely linked? I know you've touched on that. So if, you, if there's anything you want to add, and also in terms of what more the AG can do in terms of encouraging better service delivery. Um, and then Joachim, maybe um, in terms of the benefits and the cost of actually focusing on these value for money or performance audits rather than just financial compliance um, and why in South Africa 
that may not be the best approach or, yeah, just in terms of that. Um, yeah, I know you've, you've mentioned in terms of the ways that financial compliance is, um, is a, a necessary but not sufficient condition for service delivery. So maybe you can go into that. Um, I wrote some notes. Um, and then, um, Pandi, if you want to maybe go into looking at how the three-tier structure of governance actually affects accountability and performance of leaders in relation to service delivery. Um, and then we'll move to the floor. So I think let's start with Tommy. If I think the issue of service delivery, I think, uh, for the office is becoming a tropical one to an extent where what we then said for the upcoming financial year, we're trying to match what you have as the deliverables that you're planning uh, compared to what are the citizens' lived experiences. And part of it entails us getting a better understanding of what are some of the pain points for our citizens. I mean, if you speak to anybody that normally uses a public hospital, the first thing they'll tell you about is the patient waiting time, for an example. They'll tell you about how long it takes for somebody to get an appointment to go for an operation. And I think uh, the last statistics we had was we actually have a backlog of over 300,000 uh, operations, only in Gauteng. And, and that I just um, uh, need to verify that number, but it's, it's a big issue. So for us, we're then saying, let's take these messages to the whole accountability, uh, accountability ecosystem that we spoke about earlier on. And what we are trying now to influence, it's a particular culture shift in the public sector where we're saying, look, when we're drafting the APPs, when we're drafting some of our objectives, let's look at what is a, what I'll call a social return on investment, if I can call it that, what is a public value benefit that's there for the uh, citizens of the country. And we don't want to get to a situation where, yes, we have an APR uh, at the end of the financial year, everything is green, but the citizens are saying the opposite. In other words, they're not feeling what you're saying you've done. That creates a bit of a dilemma. So we're moving with the issue of a culture shift where we're trying by all means to say, let's influence then this whole planning process. What we are going to be engaging uh, some of the accountability ecosystem uh, 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 team members on is, how do you integrate your planning uh, processes? I think part of the performance audits, uh, performance audits we've done in some areas, you find that there is a very nice structure which is uh, built, uh, whether it's a hospital or what, but somehow there is no water. Somehow there is no other critical infrastructure that should support that. Then that says a lot in terms of how do we plan as government. So we're trying by all means to say for us then to get closer to service delivery. One, as AGSA, yes, we're not questioning policy, but we're going to get an even better understanding directly from the people that are affected what are some of their uh, lived experiences? We're going to be looking at your APPs. We're then going to be going to these engagements with all these uh, uh, in, uh, accountability ecosystem members with the view to say, let's shift uh, the culture in the public sector. I mean, some people are fortunate if they can't get a particular service in the public sector, they can opt to pay for a better service in the private sector from their own pockets. Some people are just unfortunate, they can't afford that. That is the reality of what we're facing in South Africa. The imbalances of the past still exist. And the only way we can deal with the imbalances of the past is to make sure that at least, at minimum, we provide the basic services that are required. And we will have a voice as the AGSA on whether we're winning the battle on service delivery or not. I'll stop there. Thanks. Yeah. Um, let, let me respond di directly to the question that you posed, and I think it connects uh, a little bit. It was about the trade-off between doing financial audits and uh, perform performance audits. So the financial audits really check that the information, the financial information is reliable. Um, the performance audits, which the Public Audit Act in South Africa, I think it's called, does make provision for. So it does make provision for the assessing the economy efficiency and effectiveness of, of service delivery. That is probably something that is, you know, not happening at a big scale at, at the moment. 
I wouldn't say necessarily that that is a bad thing. I think in, I've always said, and I, I think I believe this to be true, um, that when compliance issues are a major problem, a focus on compliance and a focus on the sort of the foundations is the reporting goods. You know, are you complying with key legislation? Can we trust what you're, what you're telling us? It's really important. If you don't do that and you jump to performance, you're sort of missing something. I would worry a great deal about that. I, I, so I think the focus is right on, 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 on sort of financial audits and, uh, and these predetermined objectives and the compliance components of, of that. However, sort of moving, moving to that environment where we think about service delivery, I think at some point the jump to more performance auditing to support that uh, would be very beneficial as long as it doesn't come at the expense of the financial audit activity. And uh, just a few thoughts on that. I think w what we find in the UK in the Public Accounts Committee, for example, the Public Accounts Committee is one of the few <laughs> very well-functioning parliamentary committees in, in the UK. Um, they look at roughly 40 reports a year um, and almost all of them, almost all of them are value for money reports. It's extremely rare, so that's what we call performance audits. It's quite rare for the Public Accounts Committee to look at a financial audit. That can happen if a department really tanked or something went really badly wrong in a particular place. Then they will do it. But what that shows you, and I think uh, what, what um, the point I, I think that's important here in this context is that uh, performance audits have been very useful in reviving that debate and in, in sort of bringing that debate about delivery more to the fore because MPs understand performance better than they understand financial statements. Um, and uh, the public connects with these issues at a different level than when you say here's a financial audit. Sure, that also hits sort of public uh, perception and understanding when you say the money can't be accounted for. And that makes people angry at, the, at that sort of level. But if you want to speak about service delivery, I think that sort of other way of looking at auditing is very, very important. And certainly the experience in some other countries, I've, I've seen how that can get uh, MPs engaged, for example, and the press engaged because they understand the issues. They can sort of relate to the uh, coal face issues that are, re are connected with that much, much more easily than when it comes to financial statements. Uh, yeah, on this question of the three tiers and accountability, I mean, I think those the people that drafted our constitution uh, envisaged uh, cooperative governance. I mean, this is clearly stated in the constitution. The word federation doesn't appear anywhere in the constitution. But in practice, we are a federation because each of the levels of government, each of the tiers of, the gov of government function independently. Pro provinces think of themselves as governments, uh, whereas their function is merely policy implementation. But they decide on resources. How much of resources must be allocated to education, for example? Whether that amount allocated to education will actually address the policies that are being made in Pretoria is not an issue for a provincial government. Because the MEC, the person responsible for education in the province, reports to the premier of the province, doesn't report to the minister of education. And so what was originally envisaged as a system in which there would be cooperation on the one hand and a level of independence in terms of governance has gravitated more towards independence, quote unquote. And so this has serious implications for policy implementation. Because the province, I'm just talking about provinces and national for, for, for the moment, the provinces decide what their priorities should be. And these don't necessarily coincide with those are making policy at the center. And so, of course, the government denies this, that there is, uh, you know, they have institutional mechanisms like uh, ministerial committees to discuss these issues. And all of these MECs go to Pretoria, they talk to the minister, they agree with the minister, they go back to the province and do their own thing. 
But I, but I wanted to say that maybe, you know, as soon as we're done here, yeah, somebody needs to rush this paper over to the presidency because we hear that there's a soon-to-be changes in cabinet. Um, and to be useful for, I think, for ministers to be thinking about some of these issues, right? Um, but I do want to bring into the, into the discussion the role of the DG. And I've, when I first saw the title, I thought maybe this title should be Do Ministers Matter in Audit Outcomes? Sort of dot, 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 depending on the DG. Um, because when we, when we wrote the Public Finance Management Act, and I am raising the Public Finance Management Act for the first time in this discussion, it, and I think it's sort of in the framework that, that, that you had presented, Prof, Prof um, Pillay, and that is that the Public Finance Management Act had a very clear role for the minister. The minister is the executive authority responsible for policy outcomes. Um, the Director General is the accounting officer, and because the Director General has an accounting officer responsibility, it was essentially about the outputs that were being produced by programs that was being purchased in the form of goods and services, right? So you made the Director General as the accounting officer, and even the Minister's budget was located with the department. So the Director General was accountable for the Minister's budget, and, and this played out in, in, in interesting ways, um, and, and that's why I, I'm emphasizing this sort of relationship between the Minister and the DG. The two examples, the first is um, correctional services. Um, minister, former Minister Balfour, and the relationship with the DG at the time, the late Vernie Peterson. Um, where the minister was intent on pushing through a supply of, of food tender, um, uh, feeding prisoners, um, supplied by um, a, a, a once powerful company called Busasa. And the DG pushed against it because it was in violation of Procurement Act, it was in violation of the, of the Public Finance Management Act. And the DG was extremely courageous in pushing back and used all the mechanisms at his disposal provided by the Public Finance Management Act. So wrote to the Treasury, Treasury took the side of the DG. And the next thing that when the minister still did not budge, the DG went to the presidency. Um, and that's where things started getting a bit, a bit, a bit um, um, shady, I suppose. Um, as a result, the DG was shifted, which was, I suppose, the prerogative of the president at the time. Um, but it was precisely what the Public Finance Management Act had required of a DG. Because if that had gone unchallenged by the DG, it would have resulted in a qualified audit or a adverse finding, right? And then the other interesting one was the one that when Michael was still around in the Treasury was um, when Des van Rooyen rocked up as the weekend special minister. He went into the DG's office with three advisors, I think it was three advisors, and he said to the DG, um, this person is going to be on the books of the Treasury as my advisor. Number two is going to be on the books of the Treasury as my advisor. But this third person, you don't have to put him on the books. You just need to give him an access card to get into the ministry. And the DG um, said, no, it doesn't work that way. I'll put them on the books and they'll be allowed to come into the... But that third one is not allowed. If he's not on the books, then he doesn't have access. And then the DG reminded the minister that y your budget that pays your salary and the salaries of the advisors are all located with the department, and I'm the accounting officer for that budget. Um, and the third person was not hired. The Treasury also pushed back on lots of other things, right? I mean, to get uh, um, the SAA um, deal, possibly also the nuclear, the nuclear deal. Um, so I think that that role of the director general in an audit outcome um, 
I think needs to be elevated um, because I think the minister as the executive authority is almost going to want to push the boundaries, right? Which I think leaders are going to always want to do. Um, and it is for the accounting officer to be able to tame that within um, the legislation that is, that is in place. Let me pick up on, and I'll be very quick on this one, the role of the CFO. I think that is an important um, sort of getting to the, as Michael says, the rubber eating the fan, the mechanism of how the accounting happens and how the transactions are taking place, whether it's within the law, right? Because we do have a situation in South Africa where we have an Auditor General that is the top in the world, that is probably the most solid institution in South Africa. But over the past 20 years, we've had declining audit outcomes, especially at a municipal level. Um, and that has nothing to do with the Auditor General, like re really nothing to do with the Auditor General. I mean, it's got to do with when financial transactions are taking place, where the people have the capacity to undertake and the knowledge on how to undertake a financial transaction correctly. At what point do you need three invoices, right? At what point do you need to go out and open tender? I think there's some deliberate um, ignorance, but I think there's also a capability issue. Um, and until such time that we get that right, and I think CFOs do play an important role in us getting that right. And that's why the CFO was introduced much later on into the legislation, because we started seeing that there were gaps that needed to be plugged. But until we get to that point where transactions are taking place right, we are never going to be really be able to sort out this audit issue, irrespective of how good or bad the minister may be, irrespective of how good or bad the DG may be. Um, but, but I think in terms of that sort of point of accountability, um, the DG is, is an important um, person in all of that. Thank you. Um, so, um, Adjunct Professor Alex van der Hever, um, will you come in and I think you want to do, apply this to the health sector, but any general comments as well. And if everyone can be brief with their comments, I think we are going to add um, about five minutes if that's okay. Um, given load shedding, we lost about that amount of time. And a lot more GDP. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, I mean, I, I think I want to make a couple of points. First of all, I think that the question is what are, what are the kinds of failures that we're seeing in South Africa? And I'd say that these are very unusual. They run very deep. So, for instance, if one does a comparison within the UK government on financial audits and looking at sort of performance-related issues, the focus is on performance-related issues because you're not seeing a relationship between financial results and performance. It's disappeared because the system actually runs at a particular level of performance. Now, in South Africa, what I have done is on the, on the issue of looking at uh, a number of proxy indicators between health departments is not just to look at a single proxy indicator. It is to look at financial performance, it's to look at maternal mortality ratios as a proxy outcome indicator of health performance or facilities of performance on the assumption that if that indicator is bad, probably all health performance is bad. And then the Office of Health Standards Compliance audits of facilities. And combine those not just to look at one and seeing if there's a correlation. And surprisingly enough, there is, um, is that the departments that actually perform badly in managing their finances also perform badly on the other two indicators. Um, not as well on the Office of Health Standards Compliance, but there is consistency. But the relationship between um, health outcomes and financial performance is close. So that means that, for instance, Gauteng Department of Health's maternal mortality ratios are appalling. And so is its levels of, of irregular expenditure, um, its accruals and payables are off the wall. And so a further indicator that I've developed is basically to look at the percentage of irregular, um, unauthorized, and, um, and payables and uh, accruals expressed as a percentage of non-personnel budgets. 
because in essence, that's where that money's coming from. The personnel budgets are ring-fenced. So essentially, if the levels are extraordinary, which they are in certain provinces of those, they're essentially crowding out their ability to deliver services. And therefore, a relationship between financial performance and outcomes is highly probable. So I then want to say, on, in terms of the study, you've assumed the dependent variable is a minister. Um, I think that's wrong. <laughs> I think that the issue is to work the other way. What is the performance? And then to try and work out why the performance is, is like it is. I'd say that our unusual levels are due to the relationship between a minister and a DG and the senior uh, leadership within an administration are uh, complex. There's a high degree of influence that the executive can impose on that position. And what's happened is that the turnover tends to be, this is something you'd be able to check, is that the director generals and superintendent generals tend to move with the ministers, the members of the executive. So if there is one new uh, ex member of the executive every 15 months, there will be a new member, or a new director general, or a new superintendent general every 15 months. And that impacts then on the leadership of the administrations themselves. Then on the issue of the CFO, let's look at the case of Gauteng Department of Health and Babita Diokaran. Babita Diokaran, Tembiso Hospital, I've looked at those numbers, I've looked at the analysis that in fact the department apparently didn't look at, which is um, the level of the transactions that are clearly, clearly, obviously an abuse of public finances. They're extraordinary. They are so blatant. They are so obvious that they were picked up by the head of supply chain management, who then reported it to the CFO. The CFO claimed that they had advised and that a forensic investigation was going to happen. No such in forensic investigation was happening. The head of department did nothing. The MEC did nothing and Babita Diokaran was murdered. That is the way in which our accountability system operates at present is that if you attempt to do your job, you are in one way or another removed from that position. And a DG or a CFO can do it once. They can push back and challenge once and then they're suspended or they're removed one or other way. So this is the problem is that we don't actually have a way of insulating the administration from the effects of the political structures. And that is largely what is causing the extreme levels of failure that we're seeing. And when we look at the differences in provincial performance in the health systems, we're seeing a systematic difference between the performance of the Western Cape and the other eight provinces. And provinces like the Northern Cape, Gauteng, Free State stand out as utterly appalling in terms of their performance. So I think that those are, those are kinds of issues to begin to examine. And I think that we have to start examining and trying to work out the reasons for extraordinary failure, not uh, nuanced differences in performance. Thanks so much, Alex. Um, Dr. TK, also a bit. And then I'll that's going to be the last um, from the audience. <laughs> like if we want to continue later afterwards, that's fine. I'm going to ask one question <laughs> on my mind. Oh, and then Michael also was, I was meant to. You were just wanted to come back in, right? Okay, okay. TK, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm trying to take them. I think it's a point which maybe uh, it's a question to, I think, Prof. Pandey, which you could just elaborate on. It, in a way, was this not a fait accompli, looking at the way the South African constitution is designed? You took a lot of, because we never even sorted out the issue of the homeland, that it, those administrations which were put into this so-called new South Africa, circa 1994. Isn't those things were never really sorted out. And you touched on the issue of having a th uh, those three spheres of government. Understanding that the provincial one was a political compromise, it was not a administrative, look, this is how it's going to work better. So these issues of saying, listen, you can have your fiefdom here and there, if those, so in a way, because those were never resolved, what we're currently experiencing when it comes to audit outcomes, that this was going to always be the case, because who actually audited what homelands were doing? And those attitudes and the things, how they were going to work. So in a way, I always find that, look, audits, it's great, but uh, look, maybe I'm being maybe simplistic. I we not simply saying, can you account for the money that comes into your pocket? as a department. And if you can't do that, then I, I would agree with Alex that what's going to happen then is that you're gonna have poor performance. But even if for this performance audits, let's say you were able to account for your money, it doesn't answer for what you're saying, the issue of development. And I think this is where 
we we kind of deviate. We kind of look at this office of the Auditor General. Great, go. You do it. You tell us we're not doing money well. You know, hit us, hit us. But we know at the end of the day, the bigger question is development. And I just think the way the Constitution was set up with these three tiers and the way we look at it, this was always going to be the, out, the outcome. Or am I maybe being a bit too pessimistic? I think let's yes. also use this as an opportunity to kind of have um, last reflections. There is one question before, Pandi, you start um, from the or from the online audience. Um, that is from Dinea Lamalo, and she said that it was mentioned that South Africa has a world-leading governance framework, and that this proves that having that alone is not good enough. The people in governance matter more, potentially. Um, what then must be done to strengthen controls around the appointment of leaders? So this isn't something we've actually discussed in terms of appointment. Um, and she recognizes that that's more of an internal control issue, but how can the AG advise on this and in turn ensure that these controls are being applied by the public officers? So tell me, maybe you could put that into your um, concluding remarks and um, you know, in terms of can they be encouraging performance contracting between president and ministers, something that was discussed, um, auditing leadership more comprehensively. So. Um, Pandi, over to you, and then tell me with your concluding remarks and if you can respond to that question from online, and then uh, Joachim, the final say is yours. Thank you. I'm just going to respond to TK. Uh, sorry. Hello? Yeah. yeah. I'm just going to respond to TK because I think that wasn't the intention of those who wrote the Constitution. The province was, and, and municipalities was supposed to be service delivery agencies. But because they want to consider themselves as governments rather than service delivery agencies, they're moving in the direction that you, uh, you're talking about. And I think this is quite disastrous, particularly the fact that we have these provincial governments. We have, uh, you know, we have the whole, everything there, the whole tutti, basically, parliaments, what they call uh, provincial assemblies, we have uh, MECs, we have members of uh, the provincial legislature, all of that. And so one of the consequences of that is that the bureaucracy, the bureaucracy at the provincial level is more concerned with dealing with the politics of the province rather than with what they are charged with in the constitution and that is delivering services like education, health, etc. So. I don't agree with you that this was what w was planned. It was always intended that, in my view, that the provinces and municipalities would deliver services on policies designed at the center. But because they are now thinking of themselves as governments, we have this kind of disjuncture between those who are making policy and those who are implementing policies because the priorities of a province or a metro or a, or a municipality may and does diverge quite dramatically from what the policy makers at the center had, had in mind. Sorry? <laughs> yeah. no. Okay, no thanks. I think on the issue of the internal controls as well as having contracts, I think majority of the departments, SOEs, and other forms of entities who audit uh, the, the people that have got roles to play. Majority of them have performance agreements. They do have contracts. And it's just the issue when you read our reports, the issue that we're complaining about is just the issue of the consequence management, how consequences uh, are being implemented. But for us, what's going to be most important is that when we table these reports, people read the reports with the view of understanding what we're trying to communicate and implementing some of the recommendations. And I'm going to make one simple example about the report, which was public knowledge. When we audited and reported on the PRASA procurement of the locomotives back then, when we made all the notes, nobody listened, nobody cared up until a point where this thing was in courts. And now everybody started asking bigger questions in terms of what had happened 
and as an office, it was very clear. We just said to them, go back to the report back then and look what we have there. Because we've reported these things, it's nothing new. So when we report these things, it's for all the people in the right positions who've got a role to play to ask the relevant questions. At times, they don't even have to do a lot of work by themselves, just to ask the right questions. Then from the answers that they are getting, make sure then that they actually engage the relevant uh, 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 department entities or state owned uh, state organizations that are able to deal with some of these issues. That's the only way we'll be able to deal with the issues of internal control. For so long as people act with impunity, there's not going to be any improvement in the internal control. And that's, my, my, that, that's the view. Thank you for a very rich uh, set of comments. I think with regard to the link between audit performance and service delivery performance, I'm completely, I'm completely, I'm don't, don't be depressed. <laughs> I'm completely on board with what you say. I think as a social scientist, I would say ultimately that's an empirical question. So we need to look at what are the data telling us about that link. I would be very depressed if the correlation were negative or something like that. Um, so I think that's something we need to look at. We need to examine along the lines that, that you have sketched. Um, second, um, you, both of you talked about the DG, or, uh, well, quite a few comments about the role of the, of the DG and the CFO. So just to be very clear, the PFMA does not mention the C CFO. The MFMA does. It's a difference between the two, which I learned while having debates with the colleague uh, during the drafting of, of the paper. And why is that? Because the buck stops with the DG at the, in the PFMA. The DG has responded, uh, the accounting officer, in most instances, that would be the DG in almost all instances, the buck stops with that. Any delegation doesn't sort of annul the responsibility for, for that function. So the DG is extremely important. And I think the examples that you had are really valid. And, uh, you know, sometimes DGs can be counterweights. There might also be examples where they can be the opposite. I recall, um, I think, Minister Gordon getting rid of a DG recently for, you know, for reasons uh, that um, the DG was not as trustworthy as I think he would have liked um, the DG to be. So it conceivably, it could also go the other way. You've got a good minister, but you've got maybe an entrenched sort of bureaucracy that has been corrupted previously and is, is working against the, the, the minister. So in our defense, um, I think what we should do, we can test whether the DG, DGs are, um, whether we have a similar finding as we have for ministers. We do account for them. We also account for whether they, they're in an acting or permanent capacity, which gets to this issue of stability. And I, I, that's probably something we should, we should think about a bit more, more carefully. Uh, I, w I would think in general DGs are in a much weaker position than ministers in South African departments or, or ministries and their tenure has, dec the average tenure has been declining, there are more um, acting appointments, the turnover accelera has accelerated and, and, and so on if you look at DGs across South African governments. Um, w just one last point, I never meant to say that we nail causation here. Um, so these are, these are observational data, we are not running an experiment. I think we do some things to check. A, I think we, we are very careful to say this is very robust. You know, there's a long appendix table with lots of variations of what we're doing that don't make our core result go away, which is always good for, for academics. Uh, but of course there are limitations. And while we do test whether appointments are timed or targeted based on audit, um, on audit performance, which would be a reason to worry about causality, you know. Um, we, do, we do sort of pick up that potential problem. There are many other potential issues here, and I never, never meant to say we find a, like a causal link uh, be between the two. Just a statistical association that's extremely robust. Okay, we're going to have to make, oh, okay, Pandi, I'm sorry, we're going to have to, oh, you didn't no. want, okay, thank you. Um, so thank you very much to everyone for joining. Um, I'm sure the in-person conversation can continue if anyone wants to. Um, but to the online audience, thank you very much. I apologize for the glitches. Well, I apologize on behalf of the government. Um, so thanks very much and have a great weekend. <laughs>